On. Actually, I have two surveys for you. We don't really run church by survey. Don't worry about that, but it's just uh, had a couple things. First off, what did y'all think of the coffee change we made? First things first, got me a stupid important stuff. Coffee's good? Okay. Good. All right, we're going to keep rolling with that then. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I noticed uh, I, I, a couple people have mentioned uh, along the way over the last while, and I, and I apologize for not really uh, doing anything about it. I, I guess I just want to make a note to myself. Uh, there's a lot of people with a lot of different views on what's appropriate in worship for standing, sitting, all this kind of thing. Uh, I've been at in worship services where, you know, uh, worship leaders will say, you know, yeah, if we're standing and worshiping for like a half hour or something like that, someone will say, okay, y'all can sit down if you can. You know, kind of a thing like it's just so spiritual to stand all the time. Well, some of y'all I know are getting tired a little bit. And so um, if, if I... Go ahead and say, you can sit down after maybe a song or two. Some of you will probably like that. And I'm just going to ask that anybody who likes to stand and all this kind of thing. I think the words are up high enough where if, if somebody stands up in service, you sitters aren't going to get too offended by it. And you standers aren't going to get too offended by someone sitting. Let's just all show each other a lot of grace in that. We'll just kind of give some of you guys a chance to sit down if you like. Okay, It's not unspiritual to sit. Um, and... Uh, and, uh, or, you know, it's not more spiritual to stand. It's, it's how you feel led. So we're just going to give a little freedom on that. Uh, the only thing I would say is let's, uh, if we can, just maybe try not to be too much of a distraction. But, uh, but uh, at the same time, I don't want to stifle you if you, if you love to stand and lift your hands to the Lord. That, that's a beautiful thing, too. So, but I apologize to you sitters that have been standing longer than you've been able to. So <laughs> some of you have taken the liberty to sit down. You can do that by all means. Don't have to wait for me to tell you that. Okay, well this morning we're going to find ourselves in Luke chapter 15. Does anybody need a Bible? If so, raise your hand, we'll get one to you. Glad to make sure you have one in your lap that you can read along with. Um, <laughs> some of you are probably getting tired of this, but uh, I may, I may, the change I'm about to announce, I probably will stick with for a while for no other reason than my eyes have started to give out enough to where I may have to, I may be forced into this position. But uh, I really like the ESV and I've been reading out of it for some time now. And some of you have noticed that, and, 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 and I don't know if you've made a switch to that or not, but I've gone back to the New King James because the print I have in my New King James Bible is bigger, and my cheaters are not cheating enough anymore, so um, uh, it's, it's kind of out of necessity I need to do that, so uh, sorry if I'm mixing you guys up. They're both great versions and translations, and I encourage reading both, but I'm going to try not to be too wishy-washy about it. I just kind of have to do this. So. Anyway, so we're in chapter 15 of... Luke's Gospel as we make our way through the New Testament. And let's go ahead and start in verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him, Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And so he spoke this parable to them, saying, Now, verse 1 of chapter 15 ought to be connected with the last verse of chapter 14, because I want you to notice something here. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And what is the next thing that Luke records? But that then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. Okay, these are not divorced ideas. These are connected, and I think intentionally by the Holy Spirit, uh, if not certainly by the context. It's possible the chapters 15, 16, and 17 may have all taken place in the same place, uh, and so it's, uh, that may be one reason, but certainly I think that we're supposed to understand that these two ideas, or these two verses, really connect an ongoing point. Now those who heard and those who did not are very clear right off the bat. It says that all the tax collectors and sinners gathered to him to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes took exception to that. They complained against it. Uh, they said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now... The tax collectors and sinners were those who came to hear him. The tax collectors are those who are ultimately hated by both Rome and Israel. They were typically Jews who were working for Rome. And so the Romans didn't like them because they were Jewish, and the Jewish people didn't like their own because they were working for the enemy, for the oppressor, for the ones who held them ultimately under their thumb. And so the tax collector was viewed really as a man without a, a country. He was kind of ostracized by everybody, was hated by everybody, and typically it was understandable why they would be, if not for those two reasons already, also because they tended to be extortionists. You see, a tax collector in that time didn't simply get a salary, he'd show up, punch a clock, go collect taxes, come home and get a paycheck every other Friday. 
Uh, what the tax collector made oftentimes was based on how much over the taxes he collected. And so if he was somebody who was, uh, you know, with the authority of Rome behind him, one of your own countrymen could come into your house and say you owed so much in tax and you really had no recourse. Who would you argue with? Who would you bring it to? And so you would often be extorted, and that's where this man would get his salary. So these guys were ostracized by everybody except Jesus. Now the sinners are called this because that's how they were just generally viewed by the religious types, the, the non-sinners, if you will, the self-righteous, those who thought that they were free of sin, those who Jesus often spoke to trying to break through that veneer and help them understand that they were all in the same boat. The ones who knew it, the ones who recognized that they were sick, they had no problem coming to the doctor. You know, but the ones who didn't realize they were sick were the ones who struggled with this. But those who understood it, they made their way to Jesus, and Jesus was all too ready to receive them. And the idea of receiving them really means to welcome them. Uh, it's, not, it's not unfair to the text to say he welcomed them to himself. In other words, he invited them in. Now, he may still well be in this Pharisee's house, and, and, and we mentioned this in the past, where oftentimes when Pharisees would invite uh, visiting rabbis or, uh, or great men to their homes, uh, they would come to their home, but their home was not simply like, um, you know, like just a ranch style house there. You just come inside, close the door and have your dinner privately. Oftentimes, people of influence would have homes that were opened up somewhat similarly to the way a triclinium table would be set up, where you'd have sort of your house here and then it would have two extensions here, whether large or small, but it opened up a courtyard area in the middle where a lot of these meetings would happen and these conversations would take place. And so people would come and listen uh, they may not necessarily have been invited guests per se, but it was common practice to go in to listen if you knew that a famous rabbi was going to be there. And Jesus attracted crowds. People wanted to hear him for lots of reasons. And so here in this place, as Jesus is with the Pharisees, it is still possible for him to welcome in those sinners and tax collectors who just simply came because they wanted to hear him. Now, it says a lot about the way Jesus approached people and the way he presented what he was saying, that people who were clearly in sin and ostracized for things that they knew were wrong to still feel welcome in his presence. There's a whole sermon could be given simply on that. Jesus had a way of drawing people to himself where he never condoned their sin, but yet at the same time they knew they could find a place where they would not necessarily be thrust out. It's not that they were being, their actions again were being condoned, but they could come and be with him, and he would not necessarily condemn them on the spot. He saw them for what they were, sin and all, but he also understood that he had come for them. What did the Bible say in 1 Timothy? Paul says this, that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now Paul, of course, we understand, finishes that statement by saying, of whom I am chief. This is a man who at one point came to realize that in all the self-righteousness that he lived in, it really amounted to nothing. As a matter of fact, the one time he boasts about his background, it is only to make the point that it is meaningless, ultimately. So the tax collectors and sinners came to Jesus. They felt comfortable being able to come and to sit and to listen to him because he welcomed them. Now, the Pharisees didn't say he simply receives them. He also eats with them which is kind of like building a compound on top of it. He not only welcomes them in, but he actually eats with them. He eats with them, as if to say, ew, why is that a big deal? Because in their mindset, in their culture, and this was not typical only to the Jews, but in the whole Middle East, this is common practice for when you would, when you would have a meal with somebody, you're entering into fellowship with them. The concept is you're both sharing from this same bread, as it were, in a, and in sort of a way you're becoming one symbolically. You're welcoming someone in to, to be with you in a very personal kind of way. And, and what they're accusing Jesus of, they're not happy about this. They're accusing him. They're both accusing him in front of them, which is putting them down. Jesus is not ashamed to meet with them or to welcome them in or to allow them to be with him. Interesting, by the way, don't miss this. They feel it's condescending to meet with sinners who are not as righteous as they are. Imagine the level of condescension it takes for the God of the universe to sit with them. Okay, they're just not seeing it. He welcomes them in and he eats with them. He fellowships with them. Again, he's not condoning their sin, but he is letting them come close that they might hear what he has to say and that they might understand what it's like to be received by somebody, not just somebody. 
But maybe this is the somebody because they're listening to him and hearing the things that he has to say. So the sinners and tax collectors were among those who came to hear him. But the Pharisees and scribes complained. They were among those who did not hear. They were the self-righteous, the ones who did not know they were in need of a doctor. What's interesting about this, by the way, and one of the reasons I want to stay connected to chapter 14 with this, is because what did Jesus say in chapter 14? What had the Pharisees and scribes had the best seats in the house to listen to? An entire message on humility, a lesson on not taking the highest place, but take the lowest place, so that when someone important comes in, they invite you to take the higher place, you take the lower one until that happens, lest you be put down. Invite the lame, the, the broken, the, the outcast. Invite these to your dinner, not all the famous people that can pay you back. Constant just driving this message of humility home, but it's like they didn't even get it. As a matter of fact, Jesus even drew the comparison. He said, when you have a dinner, don't invite people that can pay you back. Instead, invite those who you know cannot. And then in the parable, he tells about uh, this supper where the, the owner of the house goes and invites, as if to say, this is how God sees things. When God invites you, you didn't come. So what did he do? He went out to the dregs of society and said, come on in. And when the table still had space, he said, go find some more so they can come too. It's like they didn't hear any of these things. Because now all of a sudden, here's an example of this happening, and they're shunning it, okay? It's important for us to understand there's a huge contrast being drawn here in this passage between the heart of God and the heart of God's servants sometimes. And in particular, the Pharisees and the scribes, which they made a career out of this kind of an attitude. Now, I mentioned this last time, but just before we continue, before we fully throw ourselves into chapter 15, Remember, at the end of chapter 14, uh, as Jesus shared uh, these parables and, and these teachings, he shared three different things that he said, if you do not, you cannot, namely be my disciple. If you do not deny yourself, if you do not take up your cross, if you do not forsake everything that you have, you cannot be my disciple. It was a very heavy teaching last week. I'm sorry if I brought you way down. This one should bring you way up. But the truth of the matter is the deeper life in Christ requires that. And they heard this teaching from the master himself. And they, they, it's like it went in one ear and out the other. God forbid this should happen with us when we hear these things. But here's a demonstration of the fact that they did not receive what Jesus had said. And Jesus said these things in part to them so that they would change an attitude which was prevalent. Jesus would tell a parable later, we'll get to in chapter 19. And we know it as the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. How they both come to the temple and they're there to worship. And the Pharisee prays to God and it actually says he prayed to, with himself and said, I thank you, O Lord, that I am not like this tax collector. I tithe and I give and I do so and so and so forth. I thank you that I'm not like him. But he, Jesus went on to say, but the tax collector would not even dare lift his eyes toward heaven, but beat his chest and said, God have mercy unto me, a sinner. Jesus said, that's the one who walked away justified that day. So Jesus was constantly addressing this attitude that the Pharisees and the scribes had. But again, God forbid we should ever let ourselves fall into that same mindset where Jesus might say the same thing about us. Okay, this is not simply a historical lesson about what happened to them then. It's something we need to make sure we understand uh, and guard against even in our own lives today. Arrogance and pride blinded them and deafened them to what Jesus had to say, and therefore their lives did not change. And their eternities often, in, in as many cases as we can imagine, except for two, Nicodemus and, and uh, Joseph of Arimathea, other than that, we don't know of any, and, and Saul later, we don't know of any of these Pharisees that ultimately came to Christ or not. We don't know how many or who they were. But many did not because of their own pride and arrogance. Whereas they would scarcely touch a sinner, by contrast, Jesus drew them near to himself. And so now he goes on and tells three parables. Now some have seen in this really one parable in three different phases. Uh, I don't think it, we have to approach it one way or the other necessarily because there is a consistent thread throughout, uh, regardless of how we decide to parse it. Uh, but Jesus says here in verse 3, so he spoke this parable to them. That's why some people think it's maybe one parable that he's breaking down to three different phases. But whatever the case, this first one we'll look at here, we know it's the parable of the lost sheep. It says in verse 3, so he spoke this parable to them saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which was lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. 
And he, when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say to you, that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And so we see here Jesus beginning to share these parables here uh, with the idea of expressing what God's heart is in the midst of a demonstration of what God's heart is not. Okay? And the first parable is a very well-known parable. It's the parable of the lost sheep. Now, there's always the immediate context. He is speaking to his own people. He is speaking to, to Israel. But there's certainly something there that we would take with us even in our day and age as well. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray, each one of us to his own way. We've heard this. We understand this. Whenever we read Isaiah 53, we read about the suffering Messiah. And we come across this passage, and it reminds us of our fallenness and our proneness to wander. Why do sheep wander? Why do they wander? I mean... Do they feel like God would have taken to go out into the world and make it on their own? No. I mean, sheep are just prone to wander because, and we've said this before, but they're kind of dumb. They're, they don't really have the sense to stay with their shepherd necessarily, unless they're scared into it oftentimes. But so they're, they're prone to kind of wander off because they don't realize. A, a sheep can literally go over a very shallow hill, and this, but if it can't see the shepherd anymore, it doesn't even know how to get back. Uh, if, if we've, again, forgive me if you've heard me explain this before, but, but you know, if, if a sheep goes to a, you know, in Psalm 20 or 23 where it says that, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, it goes on to explain the goodness of God, and one of the things that it says is that he leads me beside the still waters, okay? Now, David as a shepherd writes this, knowing what happens when you lead sheep by waters that are not still. If a water is raging, you know, it's funny, we live close to the Harpeth River here, and every time we go or are talking about the Harpeth, I call it the mighty Harpeth. It's not the mighty Harpeth. There's nothing raging about the Harpeth River, maybe after some heavy rain or something, a little bit. But, but, but a real raging river, or a river with any kind of a current that could cause a sheep to lose its balance and fall in, it will lose its balance and fall in. It's not smart enough to really, you know, a you know compensate for that. It just If it just gets swept away. Now, the really dumb thing is the sheep behind it. The sheep behind it will just, oh, there's a space, and he'll walk right up, and he'll stick his face in, and he'll get swept away too. Wanting to stop and think, I shouldn't go here, because look what just happened. They're just not really bright, you know? And so they are prone to wander. Matter of fact, in the song, you know, the, the song, you know, come now found, where's that line? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. There's a propensity within sheep, just like there's a propensity within us, to wander. It behooves the shepherd to know this and to guard the sheep so that it doesn't happen. Okay? The sheep are simply doing what the sheep do because they're dumb, and that's what they do. But the shepherd's job is to make sure that he keeps them safe. That is his responsibility. As a matter of fact, turn to Ezekiel chapter 34 for a moment. Turn left. It's in your Old Testament. Not quite at the end, not quite in the middle. If you get to Daniel, you're close. If you get to Daniel, you're going to want to just go ahead and turn left again a little bit. Chapter 34. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here because God takes this shepherding thing very seriously. Not the shepherding movement shepherding thing, but this idea of, of faithful shepherds as opposed to non faithful shepherds. God takes this very seriously. Now, verse 30, or chapter 34, notice here toward the, uh, toward the end of verse 2. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. And so they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for the wild beasts of the field when they were scattered. Now notice God's response. He continues there, but go, go down to verse 9. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. Now it goes on in the, through a good part of the rest of chapter 34 there, and he speaks about how he himself will shepherd them. Who's he talking about? He's talking about his people. And who's he talking to? Those who are in authority over them, but are not exercising proper authority, but rather are taking advantage of the sheep. They are taking and not giving. They are not leading, they're driving. The sheep are a means to an end for them, rather than the end in themselves. 
Now Jesus, in essence, is telling these parables and laying out these ideas and speaking these words because Israel at that same time has shepherds very similar to the shepherds that were around in chapter 34 by Ezekiel. And so he's speaking to them about these things. He rebukes these poor self-seeking shepherds because they're not taking the responsibility that God has given them to bring these people up in a right knowledge of God. And that's exactly what the scribes and Pharisees were doing at the time. And so he speaks to it. Matter of fact, Jesus himself in John chapter 10 would go on to, to, to draw that same contrast and say, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And what is the criteria for that? He lays down his life for the sheep. He doesn't seek to take advantage of them. He gives to them. He loves them. He, as a matter of fact, you know, sometimes people struggle with this parable at one point, and that is, well, he leaves 99 of them to go get the one. Well, what happened? Now they're going to come, you know, these, these 99 are in danger. That's not the idea that Jesus is conveying. Typically in that time, it would not be uncommon for a group of shepherds to be in an area tending their sheep, much like when Jesus was born. There were shepherds, plural, out in the field tending their sheep. And so if you had to go after one, the others would step in and keep an eye on your sheep for you. So it's not like he's saying that, you know, it's worth sacrificing 99 to get one. That's not the point he's making. The matter of fact, the fact that he's willing to go after the one emphasizes the fact that they're all important to him. Okay? He's not comfortable with the idea that, well, I've still got 99. I only lost one. That's a pretty good day. No, Jesus never is comfortable with the idea that even one. What does the Bible say? That God is desiring that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, and that's God's desire. Jesus' heart is that people be saved. And he welcomes them in and he shepherds them like a good shepherd. Again, remember the first line of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why? Because you're self-sufficient? No, but because the Lord is your shepherd and he's mindful of you as his sheep. Now, in these verses, we see, again, the contrast of the hearts of the Pharisees and the scribes and Jesus. But we also see something else, and we're going to see this throughout uh, the first two parables. We'll see something a little different in the third. But in the first two parables, we see that God does not sit still when it comes to sinners. Okay? God does not sit still when it comes to sinners. He actively pursues them. Okay? Notice, the sheep went astray, and the shepherd went after them, because he loved the sheep. So he went after the sheep because that's what God does. He does not sit still, but he goes after. And how do we see this in the life of Jesus? Of course, the incarnation itself is evidence of the fact that God comes after lost sinners. Jesus comes into the world, as Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, that he emptied himself of his privileges, as it were. He set aside his glory, as it were, for a time that he might take on a body of flesh and ultimately dwell among us. And he was obedient to that which God had called him to, even, even to the death on the cross. Why? Out of love, out of desire, out, of a, out of, of, of a desire to see you and I be saved. That's his great love for us. And love acts. Love doesn't sit back and watch. Love grieves. Love cries out for. Love reaches. Love desires to see the best in the other. As a matter of fact, that's one of the critical differences between the scribes and Pharisees and Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees did not love the people they did not love the sheep. They, they still wanted the sheep to come to them. I mean, notice, they and Jesus all want the sheep to come. But it's for two different reasons. The Pharisees and scribes wanted the sheep to come so they would have an audience. They would have people that they could point to and put down so they could elevate themselves. Jesus wanted the sheep to come not because of what he could get, but because he had something to give. I've said this before, and sometimes it can be misunderstood. I want to make sure I'm clear on this. God does not need you or I, okay? Now, think about that for a moment. We talk about God's love, and sometimes in our day, we think, well, God loves us because, and he wants us to come because, you know, like he needs our love back or some kind of a thing. I'm not trying to be harsh or cool or uncertain. By no means am I misrep trying to misrepresent God, but listen to this. God is self-sufficient. God has unity within the community that is the Trinity, Okay, there is a love relationship. We don't understand the concept of how the mechanics of the Trinity work. But Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three persons in one being. That's the Trinitarian doctrine. And there is a love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus makes reference to this love that he and the Father have for each other. He doesn't need us to love him back to feel validated or to feel loved. 
God's love for us is perfect in that it is the absolute epitome of a love that is anything but self-seeking. It is absolutely, completely, and totally others-centered. It is given to you and I without any expectation of something in return. It is the most genuine, pure kind of love there could ever be. It is the model for all kinds of love. When Paul writes 1 Corinthians 13, this is the great exercise that is worth putting out there. If you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard 1 Corinthians 13. It's the love chapter, right? Well, Paul talks about how love is kind, love is patient, and love is all of these things. If you've never done this, I'll challenge you to do this when you get home today. <coughs> Don't do it right now because I want you to listen to the message. But when you get home today, try it out. Read the love chapter, chapter 13, that section there where it says love is, and love does, or love doesn't, all these things. When you read it, it makes perfect sense. It's a great example, expression of what love looks like, really, when it's, when it's lived out. Next, put Jesus' name in there. Take the word love out, or as you heard the King James this morning, take the word charity out, and put them, Dorn, you must have loved the song reading this morning. Yeah, we've got a couple of King James guys here that are just eating that up. Um, take the word charity out, or take the word love out, and put Jesus' name in there instead. It fits beautifully. Jesus is kind. Jesus is patient. Jesus is long-suffering. All this, so on and so forth. It's, it fits beautifully. Now, here's the rub. Take Jesus' name out, put your name in and try and get through it. I cannot. Okay? That's a tough one. Why does it fit so well when Jesus does it? We put Jesus' name in there. Because he's God. He expresses, matter of fact, he embodies the very perfect nature of perfect love. Okay? It is completely other-centered. So when, the, when, when Jesus wants the people to come, or we say that God is calling us to come to him to be saved and everything. Let's remember, it is out of a heart of absolute, pure, completely sacrificial, you-centered kind of love that he does that. It's not because he's expecting or needs to be loved back. He created us and calls us because he has something to give, not because he needed something. That's his nature is to give. This is what was missing in their understanding of the nature of God. Because in their economy, in their mindset, it was all about tithing and giving and doing and, and achieving a certain level of holiness. And so it's no wonder that, the, scri that the, the, the tax collectors and sinners wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. Because his message was life. It wasn't just duty and responsibility. As a matter of fact, um, Jesus told this parable twice. He told it here in the midst of the scribes and the Pharisees and the tax collectors and sinners, and it, it no doubt struck each of those groups a little differently. The Pharisees and the scribes heard this and thought, this is not the way I view God. Going after sinners, no, sinners need to get right and come. Chasing after them, that's not part of our vocabulary. Tax collectors and sinners heard that and they thought, there's a God who loves me. There's a shepherd who will come after me when I go astray. That's a different message than they were used to hearing. Jesus also told this same parable, but he told it specifically to his disciples in Mark and uh, Matthew chapter 18. So turn there if you would. Uh, or if you just want to listen, that's fine. But so it's good to flip the pages. Bless you. And in chapter 18 of Matthew's gospel, he tells the same parable, but he tells it a little bit differently, and he tells it to a different group. He tells it to his disciples. Okay? Now, not just the disciples in mass, but the twelve, the eighteen, the apostles. Uh, they're arguing about something, or they have been arguing about something throughout the ministry of Jesus, and that argument is, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Well, in Matthew chapter 18, they kind of pressed Jesus to settle the issue for them. In the opening verses of chapter 18, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, that wasn't just a random question. They had a vested interest in the answer, because they were arguing about it, you know? Remember James and John? They actually got mom involved in it one time, trying to get Jesus to make sure that they got to sit on his right hand and on his left and everything. So this is an argument they're having. So I don't think this is just a casually asked question. And Jesus answers it by bringing a child in the midst of them and talks about the humility of this little child being central to what it means uh, to be part of the kingdom of heaven. But notice down here in verse 10, uh, Jesus goes on there and says, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. 
What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray? Does not he leave, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek out the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. In the midst of a context, in a conversation about who is the greatest, Jesus makes sure they understand that when you're thinking about what it means to be great, that you bring along as part of the package here, the idea that you need to be sacrificially loving to those that God has called you to be over. Okay? The scribes and the Pharisees wrestled with this. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, settle that issue. It's not who is the greatest among you. And if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you need to make sure you serve even the least of these. Because God is watching all of them and loves them deeply. If you want to be like God, watch them like he does. Love them like he does. Don't be thinking about being the greatest. Be thinking about being the servant of all. It's come to seek and save that which was lost. It means you've got to be looking for that which is lost. That's the heart of God. And that, again, is the heart that was missing from the leadership that so many of these people have been sitting under for their whole lives. When Jesus says to the disciples, don't despise, it means don't disdain, don't think little of. Don't use them as things, but rather recognize that they're lambs to be loved. I'll say this, you know, Jesus here mentions, and he'll mention again, uh, specifically in, in the next parable, but he'll also allude to it in the next parable after that, he talks about the rejoicing that takes place in heaven, the celebration that happens over that one sheep that went astray that was found. When we share heaven's perspective on sheep, we will also share in the rejoicing over the salvation of that sheep. Okay, when our heart lines up with God's heart in regard to those lost sheep, we will also celebrate like heaven does when they come to Christ. It's an amazing thing to think about that heaven rejoiced over you and I coming to Jesus. Peter writes about how the angels look into this thing and they're, they're wondering over it. They're, they're, they're amazed at this whole idea that God is living within us. And they celebrate when this happens to another one. That's a beautiful thing. I mean, I mean it sounds so trite, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's mind-boggling to think that this is what happens when a child uh, of the devil becomes a child of God. And God lives within us. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in the life of a believer. Angels see this and they go, oh man, look at that. That's incredible. That's amazing to me. We kind of get comfortable with it and kind of forget what an incredible thing that really is. But we remember when someone goes from darkness to light, heaven rejoices, and so ought we. Matter of fact, we ought to seek to make that happen as often as we possibly can. So we can't save people. But I mean, we go out there and share the good news so that it can happen more often. So anyway, the parable of the lost sheep. Jesus then continues with a parable called the parable of the lost coin. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. A very brief parable. Uh, and, and, and I will be honest with you, I've read different people's views on uh, what people have kind of extrapolated from this parable, and I'm not going to take much from it, except I'm going to let, let it be brief and to the point. There is an analogy here, though, that, that, that is possibly what, what is being conveyed. The, the coin is not just a random coin, but the particular coin that's mentioned, a drachma, that was not only used for money, but also found a place in the headdress that a bride would wear. And there would be ten coins, typically, in this headdress. Uh, and what may be implied here is that in this very valuable wedding band, if you will, this coin is lost. And so she's motivated to find it because it's embarrassing and saddening to lose such a valuable thing. It's not that, oh, I lost a quarter. But it's like this actually is something significant and meaningful to her. And so she goes after it, looking for it with real intensity. She sweeps, she puts the lights on all over, she's not resting until she finds it. In that parable, I would simply say this that God has a sense of urgency about seeking the lost. How does Jesus close the parable? Heaven rejoices over just one sinner that repents. It is the heart of God to go find and not to rest until that lost one is found. Okay, you are of value to God. We need to be careful again that we don't flip this around to a worldly sense of what value is. You know, we often think, you know, um, we judge value by what something costs. You know, if someone pulls up, you know, 
I drive a Pontiac minivan that's held together by prayer and duct tape. Nobody's thinking that this van is very valuable, including myself, by the way, other than it gets me here. But, you know, if, if, if I pulled in in a Ferrari tomorrow, you might second guess what church you're going to. But, but you think, well, that's worth a lot more than the van because it costs a lot more, you know, that kind of thing. So that's how we view value. Costs a lot, therefore it's, it's worth a lot, you know. We need to be careful we don't bring that mindset into our relationship with God and our salvation. What did it cost to save us? The blood of Christ, God's own son. We might be prone, if we're not careful, to think, I must be worth quite a bit for God to do that. Wow. Be careful. Yes, you are of infinite value to God, but it is because he values you, not because you are inherently valuable. You are valuable because you're made in his image, and he made you that way. You mean something to him. That's a message of hope to people that feel like they mean nothing to anybody. God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son that if you believe in him, you do not perish but have everlasting life. But don't turn that around. Guys like Robert Schuller have done that and said the cross sanctifies the ego trip. You have got to be kidding me. How dare you turn the grace of God around to be a self-serving thing? Don't ever make that mistake. Yes, you mean a lot. You, mean, you have infinite value to God, but that is because he values you. You're made in his image for his purposes to, so he could bestow his love upon you. Don't turn that around and misplace the value of that. But God does love you, and he will not rest until he has reached out to you. I'm so thankful that his heart burns for me, and in response, mine burns for him. But it's only because I realize how far he had to stoop to save me. Real gratitude is born of such an attitude. And so Jesus here is letting those who basically were rejected by everybody know that God loves them enough that he will not rest until he finds them. Now, in these first two parables, again, we, we, get this, we get this idea that as Jesus portrays, it puts out there that God does not sit still, but he actively pursues the sinner. He goes after them, a message that was not something they would have been expecting or been waiting for. But Jesus lets them know, this is the heart of your Father in heaven. He will look for you. He will search for you. He will go after you. Now, the third parable tells us something else. Not something that's meant to be as opposed to, but it tells us another element of God's heart toward the lost and about his grace. And so this now becomes what probably is the most popular parable, or certainly among the most well-known parables that Jesus taught. Verses 11 through 32. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living, or wasteful living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to the citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, or the pig food, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, that's a great line, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to, uh, to, to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You can't begin to overstate how culturally unacceptable the father's behavior was to stoop to what in essence was a son who said, I wish you were dead, can I have my inheritance? Okay, I mean, you cannot get the gravity of that by simply reading through it. So I want to make sure we mention that. This is an enormous moment. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be your son. But the father said to his servants, and notice he didn't even get to finish the statement. The father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet 
and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because, he's received, uh, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Now, again, the story of the prodigal son is extremely well known. We've all heard this story. But let's talk about it for a moment. First of all, the prodigal. As we said, here's a younger son. Uh, comes to his father and asks for his inheritance in advance. Uh, this isn't just simply, Dad, can I have a few bucks? I want to just try and go out there and make it in the world. This is, Dad, I want my inheritance now. And that says he traveled to a far country, presumably to remove himself further away from the influence of his father and his house. He wants to be on his own. So he gets his inheritance. And, and, and I, I realize this is a parable. I mean, I don't know that this actually happened in someone's life. It's, I mean, we see it as a parable, but it's hard. This one seems more real than a lot of parables to me. It just, it, it, it's the story of so many of us in one capacity or another. But he goes and he takes his inheritance and he goes off and wastes it all, living a wasteful kind of a life. And the brother, as a matter of fact, the older brother, points out what some of this prodigal living entailed. You know, he spent some of his money on harlots and such. And I mean, he went out and just really just blew it all. One woman and so on. Well, finally, he's broke. And it's interesting, at that point, a famine breaks out in the story, and he finds himself with no means to get by, to do anything. And so he goes to work for presumably a Gentile, someone who owns pigs, non-kosher animals. He goes to the world for help to find some way to get by, and he's so poor. I heard someone once say, there's poor and there's po. This guy was po. And he was so that he wanted to eat, even just what the pigs were eating, just some slop there that they're eating, you know, carrot pods, whatever kinds of little chunky bits of stuff from the pig food, that's what he wants to eat. That's starting to look good to him. So he's at bottom. That's what Jesus is implying. He's at the bottom. He's, you know, presumably a Jew working for a Gentile, eating unkosher food among unkosher animals, working for an unkosher person. He's at bottom. And as he's in that place, and again, I love the line, and when he came to himself, and it means just what you think, he came to his senses, and suddenly he realized where he was and how he got there. And I think it's genuine humility that causes him to say what he says. I don't think he's just coming up with a spiel to give dad so he can get back in the house. I think he's really broken here, and I think that's what Jesus is trying to imply. And he says, I'll go back home, I'll... I'll humble myself out before my father. I'm truly, I blew it. I've blown it. By the way, as a quick aside, some of your teenagers here, some of your younger people, um, take heart with this and take heed to this. If you find yourselves in a place where you step out and you fail, you try and do something and you feel like, I don't want to go home and tell my parents because I'm going to feel like a failure. Chances are your parents have failed along the way too. I know I have. I've got stories to tell Nina when she's old enough to handle them. But don't, don't feel like you can't go home. Okay, that's important for you to know. He goes home, he's humble, and I would suggest you go home this way. And as he goes to his father, his father, is, he sees him coming down the road. And I think what Jesus is implying there is the father is looking for him down the road. Now notice the difference in this parable than the other two. The father didn't go after him in this particular case, but he was watching for him. But it was the fact that the son knew he could go home that drew him back. You see, God has provided grace for us so that we stumble and we fall, no matter how badly we have fallen. 
it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, isn't it? The fact that we know we have a home. And so he goes home, and he begins to share with his father, I'm sorry, I, you know, I don't even deserve to be your son anymore. I mean, I, I deserve to be working with the servants. I don't even need to be acknowledged. I don't deserve the place I had. I don't deserve it. But the father doesn't even let him finish the thing. I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against God. The father stops him halfway through his confession, through his coming clean. He calls to those who are his servants. He says, go get a robe, get, get a ring, which spoke of authority. Kill the fatted calf, we're gonna celebrate. The son, I, I have to imagine, would have been utterly shocked at the response of his father. The fact that his father ran out to greet him, that he was even looking for him, that he ran out and greeted him and wept over him and kissed him and threw his arms around him and embraced him back, not as a servant, not as a, a good-for-nothing, home-leaving kid, but as my son. And notice something else. He doesn't go get him cleaned up before he accepts him back. He doesn't make him go take a bath and shower up and everything, and then now is the big embrace. No, dirty, filthy, stinky. The guy didn't have money to get a shower, so he probably still smelled like the pigs he was eating with. And as he walks up to Dad, Dad says, get the coat on him. Let the world know he's mine. Put the ring on him. Give me authority he has as my son. And let's feast. Because my son was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. There are some things when, when I go to heaven that I really want to experience. And one of those is I want to hear this, I want to know what it was like to hear this parable being told in the context it was told. I want to see the responses, the reactions. I want to, I want to know what it was like to hear Jesus say this. And there are a few things that's moving. I think it's intentionally moving as this passage, when we think about the grace of God and how willing he is to receive back a sinner. Never let the joy and the wonder of that leave you, ever. Now there's another son that comes into the story at this point. Again, verse 25, the older son, he's working, isn't he? He's out in the field. He's being obedient to his dad. He's being a good, upright son. He's doing what's required of him by his own testimony. And, and, and you know, I don't think we have to argue with it and make a big deal out of Willie was, uh, you know, maybe he did sin once or twice. Of course he did. I mean, if he was a real person, then he did. But but he lived an upright life. He did what was required. He had no problem with serving God and even obey, or serving his father and obeying the law of his father. I've never sinned against you and I've, 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 I've been a good son. I've never done any of this kind of stuff. How come you never had a party for me? Notice here, he wouldn't even come in the house. And so the father went after him and begged him to come in. But he still wouldn't. They had this discussion outside. He still would not come in. He said, look, all that I have is yours, okay? But we should rejoice because this brother of yours, this son of mine was lost and he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive again. He's come back to me. We should be merry over this. We don't know what the older son's response was. Jesus never continued the story past that point. I think that's intentional too. But who is the older son? I think specifically it would have been the Pharisees and scribes that were the older brother in this story. But I think it's broader than that, too. It's any self-righteous person that thinks they have earned their way into the favor of God. Somebody who would look down on somebody who came out of the gutter and said, what business does this guy have coming to the table? I've never done anything like this person. That seems for me. That's who Jesus is talking about. Notice what happens here. The Father, you know, Jesus has already told uh, throughout his ministry to the Pharisees, you know, crying out to Israel and all this kind of thing. I, I, you know, basically, in essence, telling them he's invited them to come in, but they would not, kind of a thing. Well, here in parable form, he tells that basic story. The son won't come in, so the father still goes to him and pleads with him to come. Okay, don't miss that. He's pleading with the self-righteous son to come, and he still will not. He's still angry, and he's prideful about it. He says, no, I'm not like this one. Thank you, father, that I'm not like this son. I go out and work. I don't break your law. The father still loves him. He went out to get him. But he didn't come in. 
arrogance and his pride would not let him come in. And when he invited him yet again, we, we don't know how the story ends. And I think, again, that's intentional. Why? Because the story has not been fully written for the Pharisees and the scribes yet either. They can still choose to come in at this point. They're still alive. They're still breathing. We know that they predominantly don't, but they could. Had they listened to this story and allowed that conviction to sink into their hearts, they may well have responded, as I think Jesus had hoped they would. And so it leaves the story open-ended. Now, the sheep and the coin, the sun, as we've kind of alluded to, you know, these, they're all lost things in the parables, aren't they? But they're not the only thing that had been lost. In Israel's religious life, in their, in their, in their religious practices and rituals and in obedi obeying the law, what else had been lost was a real knowledge of the heart of God. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to portray in these stories so that it not be lost any longer, certainly not on those who needed and knew they needed to be saved. And so he shares these parables with the intention of letting them know that there's a God who loves them, a Father who wants to welcome them back and will even come after them to ultimately bring them home. I think the last statement that, Je that the, the Father in Jesus' parable makes about his lost son, uh, or in the second to last statement, but he makes the statement twice, he was dead and is alive again. There is uh, an element to self-righteousness that permeates a lot in the heart of the self-righteous. And it's simply this. If we think we're well, we don't need a physician. But the real problem is not only that we're sick, we're dead in our sins and trespasses. Jesus did not come simply to make sick people well. He came to make dead people live. He came to bring to life those who were dead in sin. When you think about the monumental thing that is in your life and mine for what he did, what can you do but want to come home and express that gratitude? There may be some in this place right now who have wandered far from God and are not walking with him with any sense of intention whatsoever. This is for you. Listen. Know that you have a father who is just waiting for you to come home. And he's actively pursued you. He is desiring to come and get you. Don't fight that. Don't walk away. Don't let your heart stay in that place. Answer that and come home. You will be received. You will be received. There is no doubt. And if there's any of you in this room that have never come to Christ in the first place, I want you to know that God loves you in the same way. And he's actively desiring that you would come to him. As a matter of fact, we're going to partake of communion in just a moment after I pray. And if there was ever an example of or an expression of the love of God, it's the cross. It was an instrument of terrible pain and suffering for Jesus, and for any, really, in that time who were criminals in Rome, but for Jesus, it was even more so, because he took not only the pain physically, but he took our sins upon himself, and for the only time, by the only person in all of eternity who would understand this kind of pain, he looked to the Father and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Nobody would know the pain of that like Jesus because no one had ever been as close to the Father as he. But the answer to that question is so that you and I would not have to be forsaken. So don't say no to the Lord anymore. Today is the day. I'm going to pray right now. And we're going to close our time of message as we move into the time of communion. So let's bow our hearts, bow our heads for just a moment. Father, we want to thank you for this time this morning and just the the beauty of your love for us. Fathers, I heard someone say this week, the law tells us how far we ran from you, but grace tells us how far you ran for us, to us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that you love us like you do. And we just want to respond to that, Lord, by saying thank you, by surrendering ourselves to you. I pray, Lord, that if there are any in this room that have walked away from you or have just kind of forgotten what it meant to walk as a child of God, but I pray this morning as you've given us this word that, Lord, you would be speaking to their hearts, bring them to a place of repentance, that they would remember from where they have fallen, that they would repent and they'd return to those first works. And they would once again invite 
you into their lives in such a way where that fire is kindled once again. Father, if there's any in this room, or in the sound of my voice for that matter, who uh, has never come to Christ and made him their personal Lord and Savior, has never come and received the grace that you have given through your Son, I pray the Lord here in this moment, they would change that. They would come to you. They would look to the cross and to the Savior who died for them on it. Confess and be saved. If that's you, then just repeat a very simple prayer after me. It's simple because it's just intended to be a way for you to convey to the Lord your desire to be forgiven, that you're sorry for your sins. So just repeat after me if you would. Heavenly Father, I realize that I am a sinner. Let's take some time to spend with the Lord, confess, thank Him, consider these things, and then partake. We won't partake together per se, but... As you feel it, thank you.
just want to thank you for reminding us of the cross, giving us a few moments to consider the blood that was shed, the grace that was given, the forgiveness we enjoy, the eternity you have planned, the relationship we enjoy now. You're a good God and you're crazy for us. In spite of our sin, you love us. We just bless you. For these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we all stand and sing the closing song again? <laughs>